Okay. Well, salam alaikum, everybody. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa min astada bihadi ala yawm al I am very happy to have Dr. Mukhtar Ali again, gracefully joining us, graciously joining us, giving us his time and his wisdom um, for a second time now. Um, I was frankly overwhelmed by the kind of positive response that we got to our first session. Um, alhamdulillah. Um, and I uh, have uploaded that session on YouTube. Uh, today's session is a follow up to that session. So it'll be a continuation of that conversation. It will be freestyling. We will move across different topics, inshallah. Uh, but the objective is to dig in maybe a little bit deeper. And uh, we are just very fortunate um, to have somebody uh, with Dr. Mukhtar's knowledge who is able to sit down with us. Uh, frankly, when I spoke to some of the, some of the people uh, that looked at, looked at the video and watched the video, they just told me, reminded me how fortunate we are. And obviously, uh, we are very grateful to, to you, Dr. Mukhtar, for making yourself available. Um, hopefully, everyone is doing well. So, uh, Dr. Mukhtar, before I jump into the questions, I just wanted to maybe ask you to spend a couple of minutes uh, to talk about how did how did you like the format for last time? Uh, did you take anything away from the last conversation that would be useful for us before I jump into some of our questions? <clears throat> oh, first of all, salam alaikum, everyone, and really happy to be here. This is this is a great forum. Um, I think it's a very good format uh, to kind of engage in the topic more of a dialogue and, and um, you know, um, a conversation rather than a lecture or, or, or a speech. And that format is really good because what happens is that in the, in the course of the conversation, um, topics come up, things, ideas come up, and uh, maybe things I haven't thought about are being asked in the, in the, in the discussion. So... <clears throat> It's, a, it's kind of a, a flow and a dynamic that um, really helps develop these ideas, even though maybe I've written about these ideas or I've studied them. But when, you, when you're asked some specifics or some, something comes up that's very specific, and we'll do that today as well, you'll find that um, you know, there's always something new to learn. You know, as, uh, uh, as it is said, that you know, someone who's teaching is always learning. So the teaching or discussing is, is actually a learning process. So this is how it is for me. Well, thank you so much. And actually, I wanted to start with, um, as I watched the video uh, of, of our recording, and as I thought about, you know, all the wonderful things that we discussed, to me, one of the statements that you made that really stands out was this idea of every day being a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you said every day is a conversation with God. And Part of that is, is to find what is the mauzu of conversation? What is the topic of the conversation? You know, mm -hmm. and you mentioned, and sometimes it could be nature, it could be something else, it could be ourselves, it could be society. And I was wondering if you could start with uh, maybe elaboration of this idea, right? Like, first of all, how, what does that mean? What does the topic of conversation mean? How do you go about finding the topic of conversation? And perhaps from your own practice, Doctor, could you give us some uh, tidbit on how to do that? And we'll come back to it, inshallah, towards the end of the session when we go towards more practical questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would love to start with that because I just thought it was very profound, that statement you made. So this idea of hadith ma'Allah, which is speaking to God, hadith ma'Allah is, is a bona fide spiritual practice. Now, when we think of spiritual practice in the Islamic tradition, we we see that there are essentially the five pillars: salah, siyam, and so on. And, and these are disciplines. But within that, with those disciplines, particularly prayer, we have we have salah, we have dua. Dua is a form of speech and supplication, asking, pleading, and so on. So that's a form. That is the more canonical form of conversation that we have but there's another type of conversation that we have which is something it comes naturally it comes from our own heart it comes from you know your own particular condition rather than emulating or 
imitating the words um, of a prophet or of a saint, no matter how beautiful and perfect they are, there's something to be said about the condition of the human heart of each individual who ha has a connection to God in whatever language, in whatever mode of speaking that they have. And this is something that is extremely, um, unfortunately, uh, overlooked, but extremely valued in the eyes of the spiritual teachers and masters. And it breeds sincerity. It breeds authenticity. When you speak to God authentically, you are really tapping into your personal life experience. So you get away from this idea of religion as being taqlid or imitation or constantly emulating. You realize that the prophet is, he had his own trajectory. He had his own, he had his own conversation with God. And that was recorded. And this becomes dua mafur. So these are things that we have received from the prophet. But it's not necessary to always uh, mimic or, or speak those same words. They're a model. So that's one, one, one important point about Hadith Ma'Allah. But Hadith Ma'Allah, it can be said it is probably the most important spiritual practice that one can have. It's... Um, and, it, and, and I mentioned the hadith from Musa alayhi salam, right? Musa alayhi salam uh, last time when I said, uh, you know, he asked God. <clears throat> um, and he was kalimullah, remember? So he was specified for speech, for kalam, for hadith ma'allah. This was his, his laqab, his specialty. And it's, I, and it's interesting because Musa alayhi salam had a speech impediment, as we know from sources from the Bible and the Quran. He says to his, his brother, So he was afraid to confront the Pharaoh because he had a speech impediment, not because he was afraid of his life, because he couldn't deliver the message as he wanted it to be delivered. So he brought his brother along who was who was more eloquent than me. And yet, even though Harun was better and stronger in speech than Musa, Allah chose Musa as Kalim Allah. This is the first point. The second thing is Musa alayhi salam asked Allah, he says, oh God, um, anta, oh, anta, faunadik. are you far from me so I should call on you from afar or are you near to me? Anta, faunajik. Or are you near to me that I do najwa? Najwa is, is munajat, is uh, a whisper. So Allah responds to him, ana jalisun man dhakarani. I am the sitting companion who, uh, and the sitting companion is one who's close to you. So you whisper, you speak intimately with God. So this is the model that we have in the prophetic tradition. Allah says, Ana Jalisun. So hadith ma'Allah has many dimensions. One of the ways, one is the natural speech that a person has. The other aspect is one who connects with the divine signs, the outward signs and the inward signs, realizes that there is a subject of hadith. There's an anwan of, this, of, this, of the talk. And so when God reveals a sign, a tajalli, he wishes the abd, the servant, to engage with him in that tajalli. And so this becomes the anwan, this becomes the, the dhikr, and so these ideas that we have, these disparate ideas, dhikr, tajalli, manifestation, divine signs, hadith, prayer, dua, all of these combine in this one particular act, hadith. All of these are separate concepts in Islamic spiritual discourse. But the actual, the reality of the fact is that they're all referring to the same thing. It's looking at the divine sign it's being and when you when you see the divine sign this is the form of dhikr dhikr is the khulasa or the summary of the ayat when you look at different various different signs and they're all disparate and you see that there is a harmonious unity within them this is the unwan 
and that unwan or the subject or the mawdu is the dhikr. And so you remember God through that unified sign. And this becomes a dhikr. So the dhikr can be a, a, a word, a verse of the Quran. It could be a sound. It could be something speech soundless. And we always think that it's only a divine name that's dhikr. Alhamdulillah, subhanallah, and so on. But dhikr could be, you know, one letter. Like alif, lam, mim. Allah speaks to you in letters. Not just ayat, but just says alif. Or mim. This could become a, a dhikr if you understand the, the spiritual significance of that and, and you know you can read into that and what that means. So so those are those are some uh, uh, points on, on that. Now let me say one thing. This is an advice that our teacher gave us. And I'll read this to you verbatim. Okay, it was translated. He says that. Nothing will get you closer to your aim than by speaking to God in a natural way. There is no need to burden yourself with verses or recorded supplications. Speak to him on your own accord, night and day, sitting and standing, kneeling or walking, during waking hours or before sleep, in any condition. And if you make the speech your habit, do not abandon it. Because God may seek you out in the places where you habituate speech with him and not find you. So in other words, you set up a sunnah. You set up an appointment. You set up a condition, a situation where you arrive and you speak to God in certain places or certain times, certain condition. And not just the angels become accustomed to you, because as soon as you come to that time, this is your time of dhikr, this is your time of, of, of remembrance. So the angels are present because they're punctual, they're timely. The whole universe is, is running on the timeliness and punctuality of the angels. And likewise, God also appreciates and, and comes to that majlis because he wants to hear you. So he says, do not abandon the places where you have habituate conversation with God because he may seek you and not find you. So then we get into more subtleties of hadith ma'allah. And this has to do with adab ma'allah. So when not, now Allah has come to, you, to your conversation but then you abandon it. So you, it's discourteous now. Uh, yeah, so, so this is um, some words of advice. And he says, nothing will get you closer to your, to your aim than speech with God in a, in a natural way. Manolo, thank you so much for, uh, for kickstarting this conversation with that wonderful uh, piece. Um, Dr. Mukhtar, you mentioned something in the course of this, this response, and actually it's, it's one of the, and I wanted to get into some questions in philosophy slash Irfan or metaphysics, which is this, that our life seems to oscillate between universals and particulars, right? On the one hand, on a daily basis, you know, we're all distinct and uh, we're all mawjudat in that sense, we're all existence. But then our mind, our aql, whatever you want to call it, has this ability to universalize, right? Starting with we're all human beings, you know, we're all living things, we're all sentient beings, we're all beings, we're all creation. And then we approach, okay, who is the progenitor of all of this? And between these two extremes of um, particularization and universalization, uh, our life oscillates. And I remember a very famous um, quotation from a, a sage, a, a Hindu sage from, from South India, which is where I'm from, Ramana Maharshi, who was asked, you know, what is, what is your advice on how, do you, how, how to deal with others? And he said, there are no others. And, and of course, in, in, you know, in one sense, this is, the, this is the ability to universalize and to recognize that we are all interconnected. And on the, on the other hand, you know, when we look at Sharia, et cetera, we have to recognize that we are also distinct. And it seems like when we look at Islamic philosophy, 
the starting point for Islamic philosophy was more particularization uh, where you know, the peripatetics, the Masha'iyun, et cetera, looked at the world as a collection of mawjudat, right? That, that reality itself was composed of all of these components. And ultimately, when we look at the journey of Islamic philosophy, if we can argue that it sort of culminated in, in the Hikmatul Mutaliyah of Mullah Sadra, Mullah Sadra doesn't look at the world as a collection of mawjudat. He looks at reality as one single, you know, graded, you know, wujud with, with gradation, right, with tashkik. Those are really distinct opposites, but they almost talk about the difference between particularization and universalization. Um, within Sufism, we see tendencies towards both. And um, from your study of Ibn Arabi, you know, and, and your exposition last time, it's clear that Ibn Arabi takes more of the, uh, the universalization view, right? Where he says, look, um, e everything is ultimately a tajalli of Allah. So he wants to go back to that ultimate source um, but Islamic philosophy itself is still grappling with using the tools and tool sets that the peripatetics create, They're talking about the different quiddities and so on and so forth. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about, you know, how we grapple with this distinction on a daily basis and, you know, in, in both spiritual practice, but also in sort of philosophical Sufism, how do, how do, we, how do we find the median or is, is, is the objective to find the median or is the objective to find the universal. Uh, I'm curious how you uh, how you approach this. Well, let's look at the word Tawheed itself. Tawheed, as we know from the Arabic, means to make one. It's not just unity, but it's to make one. So what that means here is that unity, Tawheed, this Islamic conception of Tawheed is al-wihda fi ayn al-kathra. In other words, it's oneness within multiplicity and multiplicity within oneness. So from one perspective, we posit unity, which is divine essence. This, as we said last time, we said it's absolute being, al-wujud al-mutlaq and so on. But that absolute being also has manifestations or ta'ayyunat, individuations identification, whatever word you want to translate. Now, those ta'ayyunat or those individuations begin with the asma. So this is the first level of multiplicity. Multiplicity begins with the asma, but that's a conceptual multiplicity rather than an existential one in the sense that those are emanations of a, of a relationship of the essence. It has two different aspects or different attributes. Then as we get further along in the hierarchy of being, or when Allah emanates the essence, this essence pervades existence. So there's a, an inherent oneness in all things. But as it has, as soon as it leaves the essence, as it were, in so to speak, when it leaves the essence or it emanates from the essence, you have multiplicity. Mm -hmm. By definition, the only thing which is absolutely one is the essence. And from that point onwards, in the hierarchy of being, you have levels of multiplicity, whether we're speaking of asma or the alam al-aqal, uqul, or the alam al-mithal, and so on. So multiplicity is also an inherent facet of divinity. The only time we can speak about pure unity is with respect to the essence. So God is one and the many. It's the same one. Says, as the Quran says, huwa, he is the God in the heavens as he is the God on the earth. Something like that. So the multiplicity is a natural emanation from the divine essence. So this is, this is where we, and, and the further we get along in the hierarchy of being, we find that things are more and more discrete. The reason why they're more discrete is because every world has its governing properties. Yeah. And the world of multiplicity, which is this particular world, which is defined as the most distant realm from, from the source, this is colored by madda and surah, form and matter and causality and all of these properties. So when we look at the, the issues of causality or form and matter, 
we're we're speaking about this particular world. But if you go one degree above this world, the alam al mithal, we have surah but no madda. We have form but no matter. So you can think of fire, and we don't, you know, obviously have, feel the effects of fire in our mind. And as we go into the uqul, the alam al aql, we have universals, and those are maani, without surah and madda, just ma'na. Up until we get into haqaiq, which are the, the asma, the realities, haqaiq, or some of the order called call ayan. And so it's one, one is in many, yeah. Yeah, this is a, a, you know, I guess a, a very complex topic and many of the questions that we have today, I think will be manifestations of that fundamental issue. But before I get into that, I wanted to ask some, you know, somewhat um, difficult, I think, um, issue that I've been grappling with. And I know that, you know, I've had conversations with others about is this question of um, overall epistemology, idea of verification, right, in the in the Islamic tradition, we have the Hadith tradition, we have the Falsafa tradition, we have the Afani tradition, and, and there are many different traditions. And sometimes they don't necessarily see eye to eye with each other. Um, one, uh, one area where I see this conflict show up is in, in, in Hadith quotations. You know, For example, uh, Ibn Arabi um, is often criticized for quoting a Hadith that don't have any isnad, that don't have any um, chain of verification, transmission, proper chain of verification. The muhaddithun in particular think that these hadiths are maudhu uh, or just uh, wahim, you know. For example, and this is a very important hadith for the philosophers in particular, especially the Neoplatonics, uh, which is the, the hadith of aql or awwulama khalaqallahu al-aql. And when I looked at this hadith in particular, you know, um, I, I quote Jonathan Brown, who in his book hadith, he says, you know, unfortunately, neither the uh, hadith of the kans, kanzum nakhfiyun, or the hadith of uh, even the original version of uh, aql, which is lamma khalaqallahu al-aql, have any basis in the actual words of the prophet. So there are two or three things that I, that I discovered in my studies. One was that awulama khalaqallahu al-aql was not at all a hadith in circulation in the early couple of centuries. And there's work by Dr. Karim Crow uh, and, and others who have written about it. Uh, and the other was that if you look at even Usul al-Kafi, the first hadith is not awulama khalaqallah, it's actually lamma khalaqallah, it's the hadith of Akbil and Adbir. And it seems pretty, um, we can confidently state that the hadith of awulama khalaqallah doesn't have sanad. It also seems to have been derived from an earlier uh, version of the hadith, which was lamma khalaqallah, or when Allah created the aql. And then there are other hadith in the hadith traditions which talk about the creation of the pen as being the first one, or that the akal, for example, is not the first created entity, but the first among the ruhaniyun, mina ruhaniyun, which is what one of the hadith in Usul al Kafi, for example, says. And that there are other hadith, authenticated hadith, that are actually contradictory to that. For example, that the throne, the arsh of Allah, was existent prior to all of these ruhaniyun and that the arsh itself is a makhluk because Allah, you know, there's a hadith uh, quoted, um, attributed to Imam Ali, who says that al-arsh, um, Allah halaka min, uh, uh, I think, anwar and arba'atin, right? He talks about the khamra and the bayda and the safra and so on and so forth, all these different anwar, and that it's also a makhluk. So if in fact, hadith sciences cannot be utilized to establish that the Prophet wasalam, believed that Akhil was the first creation. And if in fact there's you know, fairly you know, incontrovertible proof that this hadith is somewhat you know, either mawdu or um, derived from some other hadith which didn't talk about this Akhil as the first creation, doesn't this uh, create this, I mean, there is obviously a tension here, but uh, it seems to me that the philosophers on the one hand want to, especially starting with Mullah Sadra, wanted to believe that their ideas were supported by hadith. And so they would quote more and more scripture, whereas, you know, people like Al-Kindi, et cetera, and they never really quoted scripture. So there seems to be this idea that philosophy wanted to be accepted by uh, the muhaddithun and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, they seem to rely on hadith that aren't really authenticated, don't have sanad, don't have proper, you know, rajal analysis and so on and so forth. Um, how did you deal with this, and how do you? How, how, what is your advice on on grappling with this sort of distinction? 
So this is a basic epistemological question. It, what, what constitutes um, truth? What, how do we verify truth? Now, if we ask the theologian, uh, the traditional scholar, then the, the answer would be naql, transmission. They base their whole uh, understanding of existence based on transmission, transmitted evidence. You ask the philosopher, he says it's aql, aql over naql, because, because the, the reason has an access that uh, perhaps naql falls short of to a certain extent, because there's only a limited amount of things that have been transmitted to us. And if you ask the arif, the Gnostic, he will say it's kashf. So the way to traverse this a difficult ground is you look at haqiqa and you look at ma'na. And this is what the arif will say. The Gnostic will say it's haqiqa, it's ma'na. Because there's, there may have been certain haqaiq or ma'ani that were not available to the prophet or the early prophets, for example. You know, they, they, they spoke within their own frameworks, what was available to them in the language that they had. And so there is haqaiq, kulli yawmin huwa fi shan, God is in constant manifestation and splendor and the world has, 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 is still in the process of unfolding. So there are haqaiq, and we're not talking about uh, daraja or sharafiya, which is obviously belongs to the prophet in the highest order. The prophet is ashraf, anbal. He's the highest of the, of the prophets in terms of his station. But we're referring to reality, right? This is, this is why um, the, you know, the issue of uh, the date pollination we have in, in the books, right? He says, and you, you are more knowledgeable about your own dunya, the min dunyakum, right. you know? You know more about these things of a pollination and farming than I do. I know, or Imam Ali says, you know, I, I'm more knowledgeable of the turuk as sama, the ways, the spiritual ways, than I am of the, the ways on the earth. So there was times when the prophet didn't know something, or he forgot something, or, uh, and likewise, it, no one has that kind of comprehensive knowledge. It's always unfolding. That's one thing. Now, there is a fundamental fallacy with, the pro with reliance on hadith transmission alone. First of all, hadith science is a very shaky science. Right? Hadith co compilations were compiled hundreds of years after the Prophet. So that compilation, which has become ca canonized, has become authenticated. It's called Sahih, Bukhari, Tirmidhi, and so on. Or in the Shia tradition, al-Kafi, this is enough, or the you know the sufficient, or whatever tradition you're looking at, these compilations came much later than the actual time of the Prophet, and we know that the actual compilation of the Quran itself was problematic. We didn't have an official codex of the Quran until the time of the third Khalifa. We have uh, the hi history reports that the Sahaba had differing verses of the Quran itself. And so they had to be destroyed lest there be multiple versions of the Quran. So if this is true of the final and last scripture, the, ho the Holy Quran, which is the divine word itself, what to speak about Hadith of the Prophet? What's Mawdu, what's not Mawdu? So this is really open to debate. So to say something was authentic with certainty is problematic. And to say something is inauthentic with certainty is also problematic. So the Arif relies on kashf and haqaiq. He says, it doesn't matter what was said and what wasn't said. I'm dealing with reality. There's no hadith on electromagnetism. There's no hadith on, on modern uh, discoveries. There's nothing to say about that. Electricity and, and communications and this and that and flight. Nothing, not one thing that's been said about that. And yet these are realities. So we deal with reality. You, dis you look into nature, you discover the principle, you look into uh, uh, 
what is there in, in wujud and haqiqah, and this forms your reality. Now, the, the Muslim mindset is that, oh, you know, we don't have hadith of the cell phone in the hadith literature, therefore, it's, it's, it, there's, there's no mandate for it. So we're, we're, we're kind of like um, putting the, the cart before the horse. Rather than looking at haqiqa, reality, and making that the measure of things, you are relying on a pseudoscience, which is hadith transmission. It's a pseudoscience. It's not, cannot be verified. I mean, there's some individuals who came and said, this person is, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, is a truthful person. Someone is a liar. You know, who can, who can verify that? Who can verify someone is truthful? Someone is a liar. Someone, this is authentic. This was narrated by so-and-so. No one can verify any of this. It's all, you know, major supposition. At the time of the prophet, they didn't have pens and paper. Or they, if they did, they were, they were writing on, you know, a very rudimentary system of goat skins and skins of animals. And, you know, it, it, it was not sophisticated as we think it to be. And this is why it took hundreds of years before the Hadith compilations came to be. So excessive reliance on the idea of transmission is problematic from the perspective of haqiqa and from the perspective of really an epistemological problem. That's one thing, because it's a shaky science. The science itself or pseudoscience is itself cannot be verified. It itself is problematic. No one can verify if this, is, if this hadith is sahih or it's not sahih. But at least the arif can verify through kashf, through realization. This is, and this is one thing. The second thing is if a hadith, the Arif looks at the hadith or the hakim looks at the hadith and he says, this is a weak by transmission. He will not discard the hadith because he has to look at the ma'na. So we're looking at not only the, the, the naql or the transmission, the surah, but the hakim is looking at the ma'na. The hakim and the arif are concerned with meanings and realities. So the ma'na is more important than the, the, the way in which, this is why Imam Ali says, you know, um, uh, look at what is being said, not who is saying it. So what is being said is the, ma is, is the ma'na. Does it corroborate with reality? Is it beneficial? So, so the ma'na and the hakim is looking at the ma'na. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it, just a quick follow up, right? And I think yeah. this, the issue wasn't so much just about whether it was authentic or not. I mean, that's one whole set of category of questions. The issue is when somebody attributes it to the prophet, right? So, so if, if the, if the Arif says, look, the intellect is the first created being, and that's a claim that the Arif makes, that's one thing, right? But if, if the philosopher or anybody else says the prophet said something, that is a specific claim. That's not a, a claim about haqai. That's a specific event that the prophet said X or Y, right? And in that case, you know, it seems to me that there has to be a, a, a higher level of scrutiny because we are making, uh, we're not making a statement about reality ourselves, we are attributing it to the Prophet ﷺ, right? So it's one thing for somebody to um, claim that Akal was the first created entity, and another thing altogether for them to say the Prophet said so, or Allah said so in a hadith Qudsi, right? So that that is where, um, to me, the issue was, it's not mm -hmm. so much whether or not this is true or not, that's one, that's a separate discussion, but whether or not the Prophet said it, and is that if it's not a verifiable statement, um, especially from a philosophical tradition, I would imagine, you know, given that it's all about principles of deduction and verification, that they would they would apply a higher degree of scrutiny, and and not simply um, pass it on from tradition, you know, generation to generation, saying, "Oh, the prophet said it," right? Even mm -hmm. though we really don't have any idea of whether he said it or not, and in fact, right. the proof seems to be that he may have not said it at all, and neither him nor the tabi'in or or even the imams, and that this the statement perhaps came out of inter polemical debates between the Mu'tazilis and the the Qadriyun and so on and so forth. So I think it was more about because you know we do have in Bukhari a, a, a hadith where the Prophet says you know don't attribute things to me right and, and 
and and the Quran obviously also says, you know, man adlam min man Allah al kadhib, right? So to 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 attribute something to Allah subhanahu wa taala or the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is kind of deeply um, troubling for me personally. And so it wasn't so much about whether this is a true statement, rather is this something the Prophet said, right? And and when right. somebody claim that's a it's a different um, I so would this, say logical question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And you have a, a very valid point there. Of course, you know, there must be a level of higher scrutiny when attributing things to the prophet. You know, do not, you know, you want to do taqawwal. You don't want to falsely, falsely attribute something to God or the prophet. However, now we come into some ideological issues, and that is, um, like, let's stick between Sunnis and Shias. Shias consider that the hadith of the imams or because the imams are ma'asum, that this can be attributed to the prophet because the imam would, whether it comes from them personally, right. it, can, it can always go back to this lineage. Right. You see what I'm saying? So right. it's, it's on the same playing field that, yeah, for example, qala as-sadiq. So we have the hadith from, you know, in the Shia sources. And, and so when we, again, the whole concept of hadith authentication and hadith transmission is problematic even on this level the sunnis and the shias don't agree on sources right they don't even agree on their compilations but you know if if it said if, if the shia says oh, qala Jafar as-sadiq or qala musa al-kadhim or qala so and so and this is contained in shia hadith sunnis won't won't uh, acknowledge that yeah. yeah so so what happened to transmission only the Sunni transmission is, is acceptable. Only what Bukhari uh, transmitted, that limited scope is acceptable. And the Shias, vice versa. Only their sources are acceptable. So, so we have, fundamentally, we have a problem. And this goes back to aqidah and ideology. Right, right. So, yeah. so the attribution of the Prophet itself, you're right. You know, um, it may be said that, um, you know, we have like Hadith, for example, in Shia sources, says that uh, Dawood salam, used to say. Now, who knows what Dawood said? You know, thousands of years before the Prophet, Dawood, qala, you know, my so-and-so. Maybe the Imam understood that from his forefathers or from Kashif or from some haqiqa that Dawood salam, used to say or, or something in the past, thousands of years ago, Nuh salam, used to say. Right. Isa used to say, it's not in the Bible, but it's in the Hadith literature, like the, mm -hmm. the, the statements of the Imams. So now we're coming into a major ideological problem, which has to do with who has authority to attribute. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we cannot attribute, but maybe according to the Shias, the Imams can attribute. And they say, you know, Kulluna Muhammad, awwaluna Muhammad wa akhiruna Muhammad. And so they have this ideological foundation which says that whatever we say as the imam can legitimately be attributed to the prophet either verbatim or in ma'na either in actual word or in in in, in content and in meaning so that's I, another issue yeah no i i appreciate the the, the response it's a difficult topic the, mm -hmm. the only last thing i will say and then inshallah we'll move on is you know i couldn't find any authentic ahadith from uh asadiq or, you know, it's often claimed that a Sadiq said that, but, I, you know, when I looked at the hadith of Sadiq, he never said, Allah. he said, Lama khalaq Allah in the, in the traditions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Imam Ali didn't say Aqal was the first created being. He said it was, you know, the, the Arsh was there before and the Arsh was created. So there seems to be just, um, it, it, it seems to have some, somehow showed up, you know, in, in the third century of the Hijra without any Sanad leading either the Prophet وسلم, or the Imams of the Halul Bayt. Mm -hmm. um you know with with any kind of um clarity but we have we have in in bihar al anwar for example this mm -hmm. uh, several um attributions to the to the imams of uh uh going back to the prophet actually in bihar um let me let me see if i can bring it up real quickly but sure. but yeah i mean and also remember that that aql is is one term which is synonymous with the ruh it's synonymous with, um, you know, Nur Muhammadi. You know, we have this hadith, you know, the first thing that God created, Ya Jabir, was the, the, yeah. the light of your, your prophet, yeah. right? So these terms 
are, are, are in some ways synonymous. They have, they're, they're functionally different. Aql is from ta'aql, is from binding, is from, from cognizance and awareness. And um, whereas a ruh has to do with spirit, life, divine, you know, the, the divine ruh we're attributing back to Allah. Nur Muhammadi is a light, Muhammadan light, receptivity, pure potentiality, the perfect the insan al kamil. So yeah, I mean these are these are all somewhat synonymous terms. But um, yeah, anyway, let me see if I can find this. But I'm listening. Let's see. Okay, qala Imam al Sadiq. Okay, he says, "Inna Allah Jalla Thanaahu Khalq al Aql, wa huwa awwal Khalq Khalqahu." Minar Ruhani. Yeah, Minar Ruhani. Yeah. So yeah. I think this is the qualification that makes yeah. it clear that it was not the first created being, right? So if it and it's it actually says Minar Ruhani. I think Janb al Arsh or something like that. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so in other words, the the Hadith, if you read it, it's pretty clear it wasn't the first created being, right? It's almost impossible to derive from this hadith that it was the first created being there are other hadith. Hadith. yeah yeah and and there are other hadiths and i don't want to sort of um yeah. take from the discussion but when i looked at these hadith the the, the hadith matan actually actually um seems to be opposed to the idea that it was the first created being that it is the first among the ruhaniyun or the ruhaniyin um and that the Arsh actually existed, and then Imam Ali and others have talked about the creation of the Arsh, mm. um, that it be it, it being a makhluk itself. So, wallahu alam, you know, this is a very yeah. kind of esoteric topic, but I, I, I appreciate you covering the different sort of epistemological bases, and that's a very valid point, in, inshallah. Yeah. Another um, issue that we find um, uh, in, 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 and you talked about this last time, uh, causality does not apply in the higher world. Inshallah, we'll get into sort of the hadrat and so on and so forth. But when I, and I come from a science background, um, you know, even within science today, we have, you know, Newtonian physics that we learn about, right? Like the three laws of physics. And then we learn about quantum physics and uh, physicists. We have uh, Muhammad in, on the call who's doing his PhD in, in quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. The laws of Newtonian physics don't apply in the quantum realm, right? For example, mm -hmm. even the laws of non-contradiction where we say a particle is either here or not there. That doesn't even apply in the quantum world. The particle is sort of in a probabilistic cloud. Um, in the Islamic tradition, we have, uh, you know, illa and ma'lul and so on and so forth. And the, the philosophers seem to have uh, tried to make claims about, uh, uh, you know, the relationship between the God, between God and cosmos using causal relationships. And, Moh and if Mohidin ibn al-Arabi seems to say, look, it is not a causal relationship, right? Causality exists within the cosmos. But you cannot apply causality between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the cosmos. Mm. You mentioned this last time. Um, and this misapplication of causality, which uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shittik also talks about in his book, seems to be a fundamental sort of difference between how the philosopher, the philosopher, uh, philosopher approach uh, uh, to theosophy versus Muhyid ibn al-Arabi. And I just wanted to see if you can touch upon it very briefly um, this distinction between applying causality in the material world, which we all observe and see every day, the sun rises in the east, you know, and it sets in the, sorry, and sets in the west, and if you throw a ball up, it comes down, right? This is all clearly observable. On the other hand, there are certain realms, even in our own physical universe, in the quantum realm, where these things sort of start breaking down, and even in a bigger bodies, you know, things like mass affecting gravitation around it, the, the space-time around it, all of this is is it complicates the idea of taking rules that work in our world, rules, rules of logic, rules of causality, and applying it to higher realms. And it seems to me that perhaps the philosophers made a leap of faith too far in applying that, and that Ibn Arabi seems to be hinting at it. What is your take on it from your reading of uh, Ibn Arabi and Akbari and Metaphysics of Thad? I mean, exactly as you're saying, causality applies to certain realms and not others. Or we can say that our definition of causality is, is limited by what is observable causality or what we think is causality. There may be other causes. There may be other reasons for things happening in the universe. 
And so the, the, the Arif, the mystic will come and say, look, there's other elements, there are other types of causes, other relationships, munasibat. So we don't necessarily talk about cause, we talk about munasiba. There's a correspondence. There is a, reflecting, a reflection of realities. Or they might use the term faith. There is an emanation. So what we see as a cause is something that's happening on a much higher and more profound level. So it's, it's divine faith or it is an emanation. And, and again, so, so we can apply causality in the most basic sense to, in the observable world and we attribute things that this, be, this happens because of this. But there might be, again, spiritual causes that are affecting things. Um, it may not be that a person dies because of poor health, but maybe because of a sin they committed. And so their, their, their lifespan was curtailed because of some spiritual ailment. And we see it as a physical ailment. They died because of this, they, because of the accident or some physical ailment, but it was actually a spiritual thing which precipitated right. this death or this illness or this condition and so again the idea of causes goes out the window as we get into the higher realms and we're dealing with nur and lights and faith and tajalli and and also uh, a a a um uh, a, a dynamic relationship with god something which is an unfolding and this is an important point because now we're getting to some of the subtleties of human interaction with, with God. We would say that the human being has the ability to negotiate with God. And that negotiation is a living, dynamic, living and breathing thing. Just like the prophet negotiated with the respect with respect to the prayers, right? First it was fifty rakah, and then he went down up and down several times at the behest of Moses. Allah yarhamhu. <laughs> Moses is the one who said to the prophet, "Look, go tell your your Lord that your community cannot handle this so to lower the prayer." So he went back and he negotiated. Now there's a lesson in this. And this has to do with the maqam that, that the Prophet had. It's munazilat, in the maqam of, uh, of being able to debate or negotiate with God. But not everyone can do that. Everyone, some, most people are limited by the laws of existence, the laws of causality. So causality operates on a lower realm, in a lower plane. If you do this, then this will happen. But those people, there's some people who transcend causality, and now they are interacting and dealing with the first cause or whatever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're dealing with God Himself, the author of causality. So they hold in their hand the pen of destiny. Where is causality there? Causality doesn't apply anymore because now they hold destiny in their hands. And destiny is the divine secret. It's the ruh unfolding. It's completely outside the laws of causality. It's something which is, which is in the an, an fi an. It's in the now. Whereas oh. others who do not have that ability, who do not have that reach in wujud, are limited by causality, limited by the causes of this world. Oh. So we're, we're dealing with different variables and different frameworks with respect yeah. to the strength or weakness of a person's wujud in their soul. SubhanAllah. Thank you. Um, the, uh, and, and you touched upon a few things, which actually brings me to another important uh, question. And this is a very wide topic. Perhaps we won't have time to get into it, which is a question of uh, substance and accident, you know, uh, uh, Jauhar and uh, Arad and you know the Islamic philosophical tradition began with the idea that you know you have the 
Aristotelian ten mm -hmm. categories, right? The the Makula, the Larshar, uh, where you have the Jauhar and the Nain Ara, the Kam Kaif, and so on and so forth. Um, and then when we look at Mullah Sadra, and, and and the idea was that you know uh, changes happened in uh, accidents, mm -hmm. right? It was just the Ara, the color of something changed, the size changed, but the substance itself never changed. And of course, Mullah Sadra, perhaps being influenced by Ibn Arabi or through his own uh, philosophical uh, ideas. And in fact, frankly speaking, modern science is very clear that th there is change in substance, right? The apple's color doesn't change just magically. It's something internally that's changing that's causing the color to change. He came up with Harakatul Jauhari to sort of crystallize that in the philosophical sense. Um, whereas Ibn Arabi in his uh, discussions on Madda and Sura or uh, uh, Jauhar and Arad seems to indicate that all of these are constantly changing. And, you know, he, you know, he uses Kulla uh, Yomin Fi Sha'an, Hua Fi Sha'an, or Balhum Fi Labsin Fi Khalkin Jareeb, you know, mm -hmm. the idea that creation is constantly replenishing it. And this, this is this Nafs Rahman that is upholding everything. And there really no substance or accident, even the substance itself is an accident, mm -hmm. which is a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Could you take a few minutes just to explain, or at least help us navigate this distinction between, you know, Jauhar and Arad in the peripatetic tradition versus, you know, obviously the, the Hikmatul Muta'aliya, and then leading mm -hmm. up to Akbarian mm -hmm. metaphysics, where it seems to change everything almost entirely. Right, so, <clears throat> so substance and accidents are redefined in, in the school of Ibn al-Arabi. And substance according to, say, for example, Qaysari is this nafas al-Rahmani. Or the, you know, um, the first, let's see, let me try to find it's a good quotation. It's, this, it's the manifestation of the essence. So it is something that and everything else which is less than that is an accident because it inheres in that substance. So it's kind of say it's wujud al munbasat, or it is the its substance is it's. I mean, it's really basically they're they're just using these words, and they're they're borrowing from philosophy and they're re completely redefining him to fit their own cosmology. Right. So it has really no bearing on substance and accidents. Uh, that, you know, resembles Aristotelian and have been seen in philosophy at all. Right. It's just a reappropriation of these two words to kind of speak to the philosopher. All they're meaning by substance is that which does not need, it doesn't inhere in anything, which is wujud itself, wujud munbasat, which is absolute being. This is substance. Everything else which comes from this absolute being, the ayan, the or um, the, the the entities and so on, these are accidents, but it doesn't resemble in any way substance and accidents of the the, the philosopher, the philosoph. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. No. This, thank it's you. A complete so much. redefinition. It's it's almost like a non. It's a non-topic, to be honest. You know why don't Me they just too. go back to their own uh, you know <laughs> terminology and faith and you know wujud al munbasit, ayunat and tajalliyat and you know, stick to that and, and everything will be clear. Yeah, that definitely created some um, issues in understanding because on the one hand, when whenever you hear the term Jauhar, you know, you automatically yeah. associate it with the, you know, the five Jawahir, uh, Akal, Nafs, and so on and so forth. Um, thank you for, for clarifying that. Another um, uh, point that sort of um, comes up in, in, in our own discussions here is, is the idea of dreams and dream interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, from my own personal experience, and it's true, it's the experience of everybody, it's obvious that dreams have a quality that even our imagination don't, doesn't have, right? And, um, you know, there's khayal al-muttasil and khayal al-munfasil and other topics, but dream, in dreams, one of the most unique things that I notice, and we all notice every day, is the dream itself is like a, a movie that our mind creates, you know, it's entirely created by our, uh, our mind, and yet, we still have the ability to extricate ourselves from the dream so that the image of the tiger or the person that we're seeing in our dream, we are able to identify that person as an other, not our own creation, right? And so that, that so much so that we get afraid of, of an animal that we see in the dream, even though 
presumably that animal came from within our mind. And so with it, you know, this, the dream creates this very interesting question of, of, of what, who are we and how are we different from the mm -hmm. thoughts that we have? And, you know, in the Judaic philosophy, in the Kabbalistic philosophy, etc., they have this concept of sinsum, right? The idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has infinite possibilities. And one of the possibilities that he has the, is the ability to negate himself, which is sort of a deep, deep mystery. How did Allah create the cosmos, even though he's not part of it? Um, and obviously, Ibn Arabi developed this idea of ta'wil al-ahadith or dream interpretation. And it seems to come up again and again. Um, Surah Yusuf in, indicates it. Um, there's also a lot of misconceptions about it. I would love for you to sort of maybe set the record straight in terms of what, how important is dream interpretation to Ibn Arabi and what are some of the practical things that we can take away from, from that, uh, Ustad? So the dream is an entry into Alam al-Mithal, one of the great worlds, the greatest of the worlds, because Alam al-Mithal combines Alam al madda and Alam al-Aql. In other words, it straddles both of these dimensions. That's why it's called the Barzakh. Mm -hmm. Alam al-Barzakh. Barzakh is like a bridge between two realities. So from one perspective, it's taking images from the nafs, creating images, and giving it surah, in the libas of a surah, a form. At the same time, it's feeding in from the Alam al-Aql and the Alam al-Ma'ani the intellectual and the world of meanings. So what we have in the dream world is that when we, when we actually see dreams, some of it is coming from the nafs and some of it is from inspiration. So an angel might inspire you or you might have ilham or you might see a ma'ana in the ghayb, in the unseen realm, a haqiqa. So dream dreams are essential or one of the really really important islamic sciences this has nothing to do with arfan arfan is the study of it and it is the dissection of what is a dream how to interpret it the ma'ani the language it gives you the, the tools but fundamentally this is a quranic and islamic concept as you said as you mentioned surah yusuf surah yusuf is all about dreams this is his, uh, 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 Yusuf salam was the prophet of that realm. This was his specialty. Like Musa was, Kal was Kalam and Ma'ahadith Ma'Allah. Um, Ibrahim was Al-Haqiqa. He was dealing with Haqqaiq. And, but, but Yusuf salam was dealing with images, interpretation, Ta'wil Al-Ahadith. And Ta'wil Al-Ahadith means not only dreams, but also in wakefulness events so the interpretation of things dreams is one of the planes of reality but there's a there's and this world is a dream itself the, our wakefulness is a dream right as the hadith says that people are asleep and when they wake up when they die they wake up yeah. so if this life is is described as sleep then our experience in this world is a dream. So when we dream at night, it's a dream within a dream. Or it may be that what we see in our dream is haqiqa, that's wakefulness. And then when we wake up, this is the dream. And that's very often the case. Our everyday lives are, is, is illusory. It's a dream. We go to work, we see people, we have conversations, we have all these experiences that we attribute reality to, but in fact, that's the dream. You're just in this illusory world. And then you go to sleep and then you are inspired and you see haqqaiq and see realities. You get in touch with your real self. You see fears or you experience certain fears and, and, and you see people in, in the past conversations and those are all realities. So which one is more real? Your wakefulness or your dream? So the wow. dream world can often be more real than your wakefulness. So sometimes it, the, the measure is reversed. And this is why it's important to understand how to interpret not just dreams, but events. Ta'wil al-hadith, as Surah Yusuf says. 
So, and, and the criteria of this is truthfulness. The, the, the sir of Surah Yusuf, if you look at all of the events in, Yus, in Yusuf's life in that surah, it all go back to Yusuf as Siddiq, the truthful one. He's the truthful one. And in opposition to Yusuf are his lying brothers. How many times did they lie? Not just once, but several times. They kept on lying, lying, lying. Zuleikha lied. Uh, his brothers lied. Everybody lied. And Yusuf was the truthful one. And so truthfulness is the criteria of interpretation. This is why the Prophet said, Asdaqukum hadithan, asdaqukum ru'yatan, more or less. Those who are more truthful in speech are more truthful in dreams, in meaning in, in the interpretation of dreams or seeing truthful dreams. And of course, we know that the dream is 140th of prophecy. Yeah. In other words, it participates in the same flavor, the same dhok of wahi. It's, it's like broken off from the tree of wahi. In ilham, wahi, these are all same, you know, we just give them different terms, names. Wahi, ilham, ilham, uh, kashif, mukashifa, mushahada, mu'ayna, they're all the same. It's all, you know, unseen realities but they, because they have different function, they have different places where what is witnessed, sometimes it witnessed by the senses, sometimes it's just a meaning. Sometimes a dream is just a meaning. But it, 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 the meaning occurred to you, it's, it's ma'ana without surah. But you saw it in alam al-mithal. So alam al-mithal can also have meanings without form. It's not just form that you see. And so, so here we have... Um, so that's some, sometimes it's called kashf al ma'nawi or the dream is so profound and so intense that it's called kashf. Anything which unveils, unveils a reality is kashf. It doesn't have to be some profound, you know, incredible, mystical, spiritual experience, life-changing. No, it's just you've see, you seen a reality. It's kashf, kashfa. The veil was removed. You saw a reality. SubhanAllah. Yeah, so, so dreams are vital, vital and important to understand. Yeah. The language. Another, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, the, the other uh, interesting thing about dreams, which to me, and again, this, this, I could be very wrong here, uh, which indicates the higher realm, higher, higher levels of alam al-mithal is that in, in our dreams, we don't have any sharia. Yeah. And, you know, in the paradisal world, there was no hukum except for don't, you know, la taqrab shajar right? Like there was no, there was a paucity of sharia and the sharia really exists in, in our alam al-madda and uh, alam al-surah. Um, the, um, the other, uh, uh, you know, very quickly, I wanted to touch upon is surah Maryam, right? Where, uh, which is connected to these idea of barzakhi realities or mithali realities where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Maryam, you know, فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَا Ya Yani Maryam Salaman Aliha sees Jibreel Alayhi Salam in a Bashar form and that this was in the Alam Al-Mithal and, and the Orafa talk about this as being not necessarily in the physical world in, the, in that others didn't see it which is why they accused Maryam Salaman Aliha of so many things you know the worst of things, whereas Maryam Salam was, was experiencing this Bashar, you know, as real or you know, even in a stronger sense than in a physical world. And that's why she got pregnant. Um, and, uh, and that in, 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 it seems to me that Surah Maryam is also another indication that the Alam al-Mithal is stronger and more, um, you know, more haq or more real than our world. It's just that people cannot see it. And you know, I wanted to maybe, uh, if you can spend a couple of minutes talking about the importance of Surah Maryam and the, uh, the ability for, for human beings just to completely miss out on it and, and make accusations of people saying, you know, the, you know and the, the kind of accusations they made against Maryam seems to be that if you cannot tap into uh, Alam al-Mithal, you, you simply are cut off from uh, lots of realities. Um, if you could touch upon sort of Maryam as well and that experience of Maryam Salam and Aliha, that would be wonderful. Right. I mean, look, even according to modern science, we, you know, we posit that there is a continuous 
flux of matter. Matter and energy are just two states of a single reality. So if this is true of the material world, it is also true, and it can, by extension, we can say that all things are in various states of being. So there's no such thing as absolute concrete matter. It's matter, which is energy. It can be converted to energy. Energy becomes matter, matter becomes energy, so on. And, and this is the same thing with light and its properties. Sometimes it's a wave, sometimes it's energetic, sometimes it's, it's a particle. So just in the material world, we see a flux of states. Things are constantly transforming. And this is the same as the, the barzakh. And the barzakh is a greater world, a stronger world, a more profound world, a larger world. Because we are trapped in this world and the only access that we have day to day is through sleep. We don't realize the profundity of that world. The alam al-aql is even stronger. That's why it's the jabarut, right? The jabarut, the malakut, the jabarut. From this, this time, the mulk is one. The malakut, the jabarut, and you know the uh, and the divine world, the, the asma, is the greatest of all the worlds. And so. What we're looking at is from this very small prism, which we call, which we call in a um, kind of a illusory way, matter, which we think is solid. And Allah says in the Quran, you know, look at the mountains. You think they are solid, but they're not. They're moving. So even he says the greatest thing on earth is a mountain, and God says not, even that's not solid. Even that is in a state of flux. Even that is moving. So matter itself is, is in fluctuation, even according to, to, to physical principles, let alone metaphysical principles. So the idea that something from the barzakh can come into this world is not outside the scope of, of, you know, of reality, something which is very plausible, that it can take on certain of the qualities, yatalabbas, it dresses itself in materiality, just as in the same way that matter, uh, energy, dresses itself, changes its form, coagulates, or whatever whatever word you want to use, and becomes objects, physical things, mm -hmm. physical matter. And that same thing can be transformed into energy. And so that alam al barzakh is a world of energy. It's an energetic world. It's a world of higher realities. So there's a flux in wujud. And, you know, the, the Orafa will say that these are tanazulat. Just like a meaning can descend into the world of the alam and mithal. And when it descends into that world, it, it takes on the property and the coloration of that world. And then that same meaning, when it descends into another world, it starts to take on, it takes on the properties of that world. So every world that God has created, and according to, you know, Ibn Arabi school, the, there are five universal worlds, right? And so each of these worlds have their ahkam. Hukm of this madda, of this material realm is madda wa surah. Hukm of the alam al mithal is images. Surah bila madda. And hukm of the alam al aql is ma'na, ma'ani. And then beyond that is haqaiq, or you can say the alam and aql is haqaiq, depending on how you define that world, realities. Haqaiq is that beyond that. There's ma'ani, and then there's haqaiq. Haqaiq is, is the ayan, ayan al thabita, according to Ibn Arabi's terminology. Those are the haqaiq. And then those haqaiq come from the asma. So each thing is distilled, is yatanazzal, descending into another plane, and as it descends, it occupies the qualities of that, of that realm. Just like in the same way that, for example, you know, um, when you descend, let's just say you have, you have children, and when you're in a discussion, philosophy, or at work, you're dealing with adults, you're in this, you're in this world, Adam. You go home and you play with your kids, that same aqil 
the same intellectual intelligent philosopher who's dealing with all these concepts is playing with with a child so yatanazzal insan yatanazzal your soul your spirit your wujud not your physical form but maybe even the form you start playing you, you act like an you know a dog and a cat and a horse and you're playing with your children so you're you have you know descended to the plane of a child so this is one way of of you know yeah. looking at how something which is in a high place can come down to a low place and occupy that place subhanallah yeah i think the the you know the khadrat of thumbs um mm. etc which which remain theoretical become very practical when we see that within ourselves there is this alam sabir that that in which we see these manifestations that you say where we have an intellectual side we have a a dream state we have an awakened state we have a physical state and then there is a true me or a true i which is i guess the the quest that many of us are in i wanted to just spend a few minutes maybe on a, on a, a couple of uh, final questions inshallah and then open it up for a uh, broader q and a uh, one of the one of the topics that i found um, very interesting in, you, in in our previous conversation and you mentioned this is i think a desire if i can paraphrase you in taking these sciences forward um, that you mentioned how many of our sciences have stagnated, right? And this is, I think, a pain point that many of us in the Muslim community feel um, where, you know, whether it's faith or even, you know, philosophy or, and so on and so forth, they, they seem to have stagnated, you know, and, and I take, I take uh, inspiration from the, from the sciences, you know, the natural sciences where, you know, the natural sciences, people have moved on from Newtonian physics uh, and let's say have absorbed uh, quantum physics, which actually works even better than Newtonian physics. On the other hand, they haven't abandoned Newtonian physics altogether. We still study Newtonian physics because it works very well in a certain realm, um, but they know the limitations of it. And it seems like that spirit, somehow we've lost it in the tradition of falsafa, for example, mm -hmm. where it, it seems to me that uh, Mullah Sadra, for example, tried to get us away from the peripatetic ideas of you know, very clear distinctions between all the, um, uh, you know, the the makula, talashar, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, he could only do so much. And there seems to be still work ahead, especially in the area of metaphysics and philosophy. Um, what what can the community do? Maybe let's talk a little bit about that from from the perspective of how how, how can we move these sciences forward? How can we take all the learnings that we have from the natural sciences? You know, recognize that, for example, when even Sina and others said, from one hate, you can only get another hate. He was saying, from one type of accident, you can only get another type of accident, right? Uh, and there was a lot of discussions on, can you get cave from cave or can you get meta from cave? But in fact, in the physical world, we see that today we know from our science that vibration of atoms, which is one, uh, one action or one cause, leads to... Uh, color, coloration, right? It leads to elongation, which is uh, which is come versus case. So you can already see that natural sciences indicate that those laws are broken down as we investigate truth, but we haven't reformulated it. We're still in the houses and so on and so forth, teaching the same old laws, which simply don't work anymore. Um, so there's many areas where we need to take the sciences forward. And I'm wondering if there are, in your mind, uh, you know, to the top two or three areas where you see that Islamic philosophy and philosophical Sufism can take that next step based on all of the, the wonderful things that we've learned. Uh, if so, what would those be and how can we help um, Bidnilla? You know, I mean, this is a huge question. This has to do with Islamic education in general. How has, has the, 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 the major downfall of Muslim civilization in the past several hundred years has to do with Islamic education. Our education systems are not, um, are not vibrant. We're stuck in the past. And a lot of this has to do with the, 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 the Muslim conception of taqdis, the sanctifying of uh, the old tradition, the salaf. And we have this hierarchy in our mind that the best generation is a generation of the prophets 
and every successive generation gets worse and worse. So this has become a root problem. So what, we, what we're trying to do as a community, as a global community, is we're always trying to unearth the ancient treasures. And what we do is we get stuck there. Everyone is studying Ghazali, Ibn al-Arabi, or the early Sufis, or Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn, you know, Ibn Qayyim. These are the, and of course, you know, we look at, we look at fiqh. You know, we only have four schools of, of law in Sunnism and one in Shiism. Has law never progressed in a thousand years since the time of Abu Hanifa? Islamic law has not found one other person outside of these four to bring something new to the table in a thousand years? I mean, he's talking, he was, he was the imam of his time. He was, you know, the, the marja, whatever, what, have, what call it, you know, of his time. And fiqh, we know, is a very dynamic discipline, even more so than metaphysics. Fiqh has to do with today's problems, has to do with genomics and, you know, all kinds of issues that we deal with today. And yet, every Muslim is either Hanbali, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, or Jafari. No one has in this, the entire 1,000 years after those individuals has come up with something new. In fact, if, if they were to come up with something, it would be sacrilege in the eyes of the Muslims. How dare you go against these, uh, you know, you, it's so, so this, these ideas have been crystallized. They've been sanctified in the minds of the Muslims. The same goes with, you know, even Ibn al-Arabi. As great as he was, an Arif, the, you know, the, 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 the great sheikh, the greatest sheikh, a sheikh al-Akbar. It doesn't mean that all tajalliyat ended with him. Even if he was the greatest sheikh of all time and will never be a greater sheikh, let's just say for argument's sake, it doesn't mean that his that there are there will be no more new tajalliyat to discover. There will be no more knowledge to discover. I mean, look how much we have progressed as 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 in humanity in the sciences. The sciences is just a reflection of God's law. We tried to we Muslims materialize science. It's not these discoveries is the discovery of of God's world. Science is is God's world. These are universal God's principles. These are the divine signs within nature. So there's no distinction between science, modern science, and real met Islamic metaphysics. Right. right? It's just an observation into God's world. But we tend to separate them, say, oh, this is material science, this is modernity, and Muslims need to stick to Al-Ghazali, and, and still arguing about Mu'tazila and Asha'ira. We're still debating these things, whether the Quran was created or not created. I mean, this is such an old and stale debate. It is such an old debate. And this is how we think. When we think of theology, we just think of these two schools or maybe another one. When we think of Irfan, we just think of Ibn al-Arabi. Irfan, there's no Urfa after him. And, and even the Urafa who came after him, all they did was comment on Ibn al-Arabi. Yeah. So if Ibn al-Arabi was the, the last great uh, Arif, and everybody from Qunawi up, you know, he, he, Mullah Sadr was tr truly an original thinker. I have to hand it to Mullah Sadr. He was truly an original thinker. And he was one of the few people who was brave enough to put out new theories. But again, Mullah Sadr is a few hundred years old. Safavid era. So at the very least, we should start thinking about and deconstructing this blind imitation to the ancient scholarship, as great as it was. Take from it, like Newton. No one is denying Newton's br brilliance and his genius, but it has a place and it has its limitations. The limitations of Ibn al-Arabi is that he spoke in his own context, in his own time. He saw different, uh, you know, tajalliyat. He saw, for example, Fusus al-Hikam speaking about the prophets. Everyone thinks this is the ultimate consummate book of Ar Arfan. 
No book has been written higher than Fusus al Hikam. And that may be true. But it doesn't mean that tomorrow an Arif can, uh, can't come and discover a new loan, a new reality about Prophet Isa, for example, or another prophet, or bring some other fuss. I'm just giving one example. So Ibn Arabi isn't the end-all be-all of Arfan. Arfan is a living thing. Mysticism is a living thing. Islam is, fiqh is a living thing. And so the first point of, of you know, principle of action is that we must deconstruct, first learn what the, 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 the scholarship first says, because you can't you know, build on anything you don't know. So that's a big problem. And that's another uh, uh, you know, uh, educational problem. We don't have the tools to even read Al-Ghazal. We don't have the tools to read Ibn al-Arabi. Even Arabs don't, can't understand Ibn al-Arabi. So there needs to be instruction, there needs to be, and you know, these kind of forums help to di dissect some of these ideas so that when you actually go back and you understand the Arabic, and then you understand, you know, look, it's, it's not easy to read Ibn Sina. It's not re easy to read this ancient philosophy. It's very difficult. You, you can study Arabic for 15, 20 years and still struggle. And I've seen people like this, studied Arabic their whole lives and are struggling with these basic texts. They're considered basic. Muqaddama Qaysiri is basic. It's an elementary text. Oh, it's not. <laughs> you know, for, for us, it's not. But for them, it was. It's a muqaddam, it's introduction. Yeah. You know? And, and so, so these were considered, for them, they're considered basic texts. Because people had that kind of background, that they, they had that kind of, you know, a vocabulary. They understood, you know, madda, sura, and the, the categories, the, you know, the kulliyat, and they had, they had taken courses in logic and rhetoric and, and Arabic grammar. And this was part of their education. Today, you have to go to a seminary to learn this stuff. And when you go to the seminary, straight away, you get blinded into this scholastic curriculum. You know, you're still, you're studying uh, fiqh, which was developed 400 years ago, a thousand years ago, Alama Hilli, you know, Alama Hilli or, or Tusi. And so, so, so that's, so this is, you know, these are major problems to think about, major issues to think about that we need to study the ancient. We need the tools to learn and to, to understand what they said, but understand that they lived in their time and that we need to start integrating modern, that, that ancient knowledge with modern discoveries and look forward. Yeah, my, my personal observation is that there were some um, philosophers uh, who lived, you know, in the last century or so. We have some, we've had some great philosophers like uh, Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal yeah. in the subcontinent. Um, Naki Balatas in, 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 uh, in the Southeast Asian region and others. But it seems like, for example, Iqbal was preoccupied with the most important topic of that day, which is colonialism and freeing the people from the yoke of colonialism. And so he perhaps didn't have the bandwidth to spend on, you know, the synthesis effort. Um, and just like, uh, you know, somebody like Sadra was able to synthesize, it seems like there is still a, a, a vacant uh, job for somebody to synthesize, you know, truly Islamic metaphysics, philosophy, you know, philosophical ideas, natural physics, modern physics in a, in a more integrated whole. And inshallah, we can um, perhaps not do it ourselves, but pave the way for it. So I appreciate you again, taking so much time um, going through these very intricate topics and mashallah, your ability to straddle so many different uh, topics was just uh, phenomenal. And I know we learned a lot from it. I'd love to open it up to Q&A because I know lots of others will have questions. So perhaps I can stop with my questions, inshallah, and um, open it up for others. If you have a question, just please raise your hand and uh, I will uh, call you out and then uh, we can go from there. I actually do see some questions here in the chat, mm -hmm. so we can cover that up. Uh, maybe not everyone who asked the questions is, is still on the call. Um, there's a question from uh, Shirin who says, on the topic of kashf, 
the Muslim community and layman seems to be non-accepting of that as it cannot be verified, particularly because of the rise of fake Arabs. Fake Arabs, I think the question about fake Arabs. How does an actual Arab gain trust from his or her thoughts without being attacked or canceled? Just as how Ibn Arabi is seen as a controversial figure. I, can, I guess to perhaps if I can paraphrase Shireen's question, it's really that Sufism in particular, and especially where you know I come from, the subcontinent, um, there is a lot of just uh, exploitation. Uh, you know, even dream interpretation is you know often used for exploitative purposes, as you know. Um, and so, perhaps some practical tips on how uh, we can the seeker can avoid it, avoid falling into the trap of a fake arif. Uh, what were some of your own sort of checks and balances that you had when you um, decided? Well, Imam Ali says, "I'arif al haq, thumma ta'arif ahlahum." He says, "Know the truth." And then you will know its people. So if you try to find the truth in the people, you can go any which way. You can, you'll go with the truth of that person. But if you set truth as your criteria, and every human being has an ability to discover truth to a certain extent, make truth your, your ultimate criteria. Measure people according to truth. So let's take it one step further. The Arif who makes a claim to truth has to bring forth evidence. What is your truth? Are you speaking truth? The Arif is concerned with truth, not concerned with mystical, magical powers and karamat. That's not the Arif. That's, you know, and any, any person who dabbles in, in the occult, that's an occultist. The Arif Billah, the one who is truly a person, a people of God, Ahl Allah, because Allah is Al-Haq. The people of God are those who discover, who seek truth, unfold truth. They speak truth. They have Sidq. They're, they are teaching the way to the truth. So this is your criteria. The truth is, is the ultimate criteria. And the person is measured according to their truth. They're measured according to the knowledge which reflects their truth. That's what the Quran says, Fa'tu burhanukum, bring your evidence if you're truthful. Evidence. Show me evidence. Don't show me some miraculous magical trick. Show me the knowledge. Show me guidance. Just don't give me a set of litanies, adhkar, and say, do this 500 times, pay this much money, and you'll be all right. I want something which is, that's that, you see, the thing is, people are, are looking for quick solutions. And whereas the person of truth is, is as truth is identified from the aql, the aql is the, the Rasul al-Haq, as the hadith says. Al-aql Rasul al-Haq is the messenger of truth. Or the aql, the intellect, is the Rasul al-Batin, is the inner prophet. So you take the, the aql, intelligence, and you listen to a person's speech. As the, as the, as the Quran says, those who listen to speech and they take the best of it. So it's not forbidden to listen to anyone's speech. Go to the Christians, to the Buddhists, to the Hindus, to the Jews, and to the you know, Taoists. Go, go everywhere, listen to speech, and take the best of it. This is the advice of the Quran. Take the best of it. القول, uh, they listen to speech and they take the best of it. So this is the criteria. The criteria is knowledge and truth. Not miraculous deeds. Those are there. When, when an arif performs a karama, this is tathbeet al-haq. This is the affirmation of truth. It's not the truth itself. Because he's already come with haq. And so sometimes the qalb has some certain doubts or the aql has doubts because the aql hasn't arrived at the gnosis of this truth. 
it hasn't grasped the truth. And so the Arif has to bring some karama or the Prophet brings us a miracle. The miracle is to establish tathbeet, is to affirm, to give a kind of a stamp, seal of approval on what he's, the truth that he has already established. But if you do not understand the truth and you follow the miracle, then you've lost the plot. Yeah. Then you haven't understood the Arif. You haven't understood his message. You haven't understood Muhammad. Muhammad brought truth. He didn't bring any miracles. His miracle was his, his truth, his Quran, his speech, his, 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 his hikmah was his miracle. Wow. And this is the beauty of, of Islam. That, that all of the other prophets brought actual physical miracles. But Islam was so powerful in bringing the message of truth that it did not need any miracles. Its truth was the miracle. This is the beauty and this is the, the strength of the Muhammadan message. Uh, you actually, you, you uh, mentioned yeah. a few things that prompted another question in my head, which is... Um, you know, Ibn Arabi is often also associated with, you know, the science of abjad and, you know, the, the gematria and things like that. And, and you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, you know, uh, you know, there were these human beings who were trying to provoke or invoke the jinns and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increased them in misguidance. And there's this sort of great danger that the Quran points to, which is that there are these other worlds and these jinns and spirits, but, you know, to paraphrase, don't mess with them. You know, they, they have their own sharia, let them be, you know. Um, whereas there seems to be almost a revival of this occultist um, or interest in occult, um, even Islamic um, science of occultism and so on and so forth. And oftentimes Ibn Arabi gets bracketed with those and says, you know, he, he used magic squares and abjad and things like that, right? Um, can you unpack a little bit of that for us as well so that we can um, make sure that, you know, we don't end up in, in um, difficult situations, which I know a lot of people end up with because they go after these uh, excessive focus on science of numbers and so on and so forth. Again, you know, these occultist um, sciences is something that's available to the Arif. The Arif might have had different type of spiritual and mystical sciences or, or, or knowledge, types of knowledge. For example, Abjad and Ilm al firasa and all these things, okay? But again, that's not the criteria. That's not the criteria of the Arif. There's two, there's two things to be said. The first part I said, I talked about as the, the main criteria is Haq, truth. And the Quran is, is it, it has to corroborate with the Quran, Quran and Sunnah, number one. Number, number two, the, the major criteria, this is the, this is the ontological view of, or let's just say this is the view with respect to wujud and ma'rafatullah, ma'raf, this has to do with ma'rafa. The second type of ma'rafa, which is the criteria of the arif, is ma'rif with the nafs. Or, in other words, in the Islamic terminology, is akhlaq. You look at the person's akhlaq, at the sawwuf. And, and, and Ibn Arabi was, is the first to tell you. Although this is, this, this is the, the, the running theme of every arif from the beginning to the end. No one can be an arif unless he believes in this principle that at the sawwuf, kulluhu akhlaq kulluhu. That Sufism or Irfan is ethics in its entirety. And this is nothing other than the prophetic message. So this is the, this is the standard by which we measure all Irfan and all Urafa and every man person of God who claims to be a person of God. No person can be a person of God, male or female, child or adult. No one can make a claim to be ahl Allah, unless they have akhlaq. Adabani Rabbi, my Lord trained me in a most excellent way. 
he excelled in this training, this ta'deeb, this adab ma'allah, this akhlaq ma'allah, takhalluku bi akhlaq Allah, bi asma Allah, and so on, attributed to the Prophet. Okay? So we have, but we have obviously very, very solid statements in the Quran and Hadith about the primacy of ethics. Akhlaq is the spirit of Islam. Why? Because Islam came to rectify the human, be human being, human behavior, to teach human values. This is the purpose of Islam, is to teach humanity. And once a person becomes a human, in terms of character, then Allah opens the doors of gnosis, of understanding, of realization. So in other words, that ma'rifat Allah is preceded by ma'rifat al-nafs. And this again goes back to the hadith, man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. He didn't say man arafa rabba faqad arafa nafsa. He says, he who came to know himself, in other words, he who worked on himself, he who transformed his lower animal self, became a human in the real sense with through akhlaq, through good works, through kindness and mercy and, and benevolence and altruism and so on. Then he, he became, he had ma'rifat Allah. Then Allah opened the door to gnosis, the doors of truth and realization. So these are the two wings of Islam. And then of course, a subset of Islam is Arfan which is ma'rifat Allah or man ma'rifat al-nafs, akhlaq and, and ma'rifat al-haq. So anyone who makes a claim to, is, to irfan or tasawwuf or any of these karamat, just look at these two things. Look at their akhlaq and look at their truth value. Look at their words. Look at their ulum. What are, their pre what are they preaching? What are they teaching? That's all you need to know. You have to sit in one gathering and listen to the level of the speech. Just listen Thank to you. one. Yeah, what's, that's it. You don't even have to dig deeper than that. Thank you. Um, Razana has a question about dhikr. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long question. I don't want to mischaracterize her question. Uh, Razana, if you don't mind, you can unmute yourself and just uh, ask your question about the dhikr right away. Yeah. Thank you. Assalamu <clears throat> Dr. Ali. Thanks Please. for a wonderful um, discussion. Um, my quick question, it's probably my understanding issue. Uh, when at the very first question, uh, when you mentioned about Dikr with all that Ajili and every other means, when you mentioned that we're inviting Allah, uh, when we start doing that and um, stopping it, it could mean disrespecting. So is that pointing towards any a routine habit of in the form of liquor or it's uh, my understanding was you want us to point towards uh, direct towards all informal forms of liquor, not for the disciplines that five disciplines are uh, formal means. So if it is you're pointing the direction towards the informal form of the care. The conversation can go all the time, but at the same time, you know, we have our day-to-day -day engagement and that can, you know, stop that process anytime. So does it indicate uh, that it means that the informal conversation can is discouraged or we have to do it when it is possible or I'm kind of confused on that. No, do it when it's possible. I don't mean to say that it's it's something that is, adab is a very subtle thing. Adab has to do with the perfection of, of character, of attitude. It has to be, it has to be, uh, it, it, is, it is the refinement of character. So don't see it as being disrespectful to God or that, you know, don't start it because if I, I if I can't continue, then I shouldn't even start. No, don't don't think of, think think of it like that. I only meant to say that in in a way that, um, at the highest level, you know, imagine like imagine this, okay? Imagine if you you every time you enter your parents' house, or let's just say you live at home, every time you enter or you exit, you say hello and goodbye, right? When you enter, you say salam, and when you leave. You, you, you say goodbye to your parents. So I'm going out. I'll see you, you know, and so on, right? 
This is, you've habituated this. Imagine if you left your house one day and you didn't tell your parents. You didn't say goodbye. So it's, it's a habit, but it's based on adab. And so it's not a habit for its own sake. The motivation of that action is adab. And your parents would feel, oh, you know, what happened? Is something wrong? Why did he leave in a hurry? So they become concerned. They're not offended, they're concerned. So that type of habit, you enter, every time you enter, or let's just say you enter, you run up to your room and you didn't say salam to your parents or your person you're living with, your husband, your wife, whoever you meet, you just ran up. <clears throat> they would be concerned. It's a cause for concern. And if it continues, then it starts to transgress into the issues of adab and akhlaq. So similarly, Allah addressing God is, you know, if you start a meal, you don't say bismillah. This is a form of dhikr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a form of dhikr or some, something else. So anyway, what I mean to say is don't confine yourself and say, look, I've got work, so therefore I won't engage in a spiritual practice. Do it when you can. Do it whenever it's available. But if you have, if you habituated on a particular thing, and you become accustomed to it, try to maintain that. Try to maintain consistency in something. So it doesn't become only haphazard, that you only remember God when you want to remember. Otherwise it becomes nafsani. I have time now, therefore I will, I will, I will remember you. So there is, that's the, the issue of adab here. The issue of adab is not remembering God only when you feel like it or when you are free from, from your preoccupations, but that you have devoted a certain time. You have made it a consistent practice. And this is what Salat teaches us. Salat, the lub. You know, aqim as salat li dhikri. It says in the Quran, establish prayer for my remembrance. So Salat, God is already has already inbuilt this principle of dhikr in a timely and punctual and an orchestrated way, something which corresponds to the rising and setting of the sun, to the calendar, the events, the ecosystem, the universal principle. All of this is calculated. So this is, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. So just like salat is the paradigm, is the framework in, in the, the, the ultimate form of dhikr, you can also take from that form of worship and then go a step further. This is why salat is wajib and then you have mustahab. And from mustahab, you have hadith ma'allah. Personal relationship with God. So that's why, you know, someone mentioned consistency is the key. Yes, consistency is the key to anything. But at the same time, don't be discouraged if you cannot be consistent in the beginning or that you have other preoccupations or your job doesn't allow you because you're back and forth, you're busy, your kids and whatnot. But just keep this in the back of your mind that this is a goal that you want to try to develop a consistent relationship. The same thing like, for example, visiting your parents. If you have a habit of visiting your parents every Friday evening, so say you live somewhere in another city, and then one week you don't show up. Your parents are expecting you. They're hoping. They're waiting for you. Imagine the disappointment that they feel when you don't show up that weekend or that day. That day. So remember, you know, Allah is like dynamic like this. Don't want to anthropomorphize God and say that he's human like, like that. But there is subtleties in your relationship. God is also not a machine. Just plug and play. Ask and receive. Make dua and you'll get, you know, like the ATM. You press uh, some numbers, the right password, and then you have, the, you know, the money comes out. God is not an ATM. Allahu hayy al-qayyum al-hayy. He's living. 
So this is something to, to remember you know, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, there's one uh, quick question. I think you mentioned it um, perhaps in the last call. You know, you you quoted the 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 tradition al uh, al uh, 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 al mu'min. So there's a question here from Tahir, which is, what does Ibn Arabi say on Isra al Mi'raj? Can Arifin get blessed with something like that? Mi'raj just refer means ascension, and in the particular Muhammadan context, it refers to the Prophet's ascension, which is a form of mukashifa, mushahada, mu'ayin. And the Urafa refer to different things, what that is. And it is simply another way of saying proximity to God, divine proximity. How that occurred for the Prophet we have very little information according, we have some verses in the Quran, Dana, Fatadalla, and so on, Qaba, Qawseen, O Adna. And so Allah is describing the maqam of Muhammadi in the state of proximity. This is the meaning of mi'raj. Every human being has his own mi'raj. He has a, a, an ascent. He has a connection. He has a vision of God according to his own qabiliyah, his own capacity. And if this was, was not the case, then Allah would not have said, or the hadith would not have said, as-salatu mi'raj al-mu'min. So every mu'min has a mi'raj. And one of the mi'raj, one of the states of mi'raj is salat. That you will find in sujood, that you, are, you have reached, you have touching God. How do you touch God? How do you grasp, how do you hold his hand? How do you see him face to face? And the Prophet explains in salah, in sujood, or in a particular ibadah, or in a dhikr, or hadith ma'allah. And some, these types of devotional acts which come from the qalb, and it's only the qalb which, which meets God. The aql only contemplates God as on a theoretical level, as a, as a being, existence, how does it being manifest in wujud and wujud and tajalliyat? That's what aql is doing. So the aql is trying to understand wujud and existence in God in a theoretical, in a philosophical way. But it is the qalb which meets God, which touches God, which laughs with God, which sees God. It's the qalb. The qalb is doing that. So that's why it's called the center of one's being. That's why لا يسعني أرضي ولا سماعي That nothing in the heavens or the earth encompasses me, but the heart of the believer with faith encompasses me, meets me. Only the heart has that capacity to meet God. So, um, so understand that you know we distinguish between Knowing God from the aql and knowing God from qalb, from experience. And so this mi'raj is just another word. It's the, it's the word in, 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 in revelation, in sharia. Sometimes we express things from the, from the language of sharia. Sometimes we express things in the language of philosophy. Sometimes we express things in the language of irfan. And sometimes we express things in the language of mahabba, in love. So, for example, Rumi, Ibn al-Farid, you know, they'll talk about the beautiful face of the beloved and the locks of the beloved and the birth and the mark and the mole and this and the beautiful eyes. This is just the language of poetry, the language of love. So different temperaments, different times, different sciences, they all have a language specific to them. And so it's important to understand how to translate between these worlds. You look at Sharia, the language of Wahi, the Muhammadan language, Arabic, you look at that, and then you move further in time, and then another language came into the Islamic discourse, which was philosophy, Greek philosophy, and they take the same ideas. You know, this Nura Muhammadi, going back to this idea, Nura Muhammadi became Aql al awwal become Aql, became, you know, this same, it's Nura Muhammadi. It's Nura, Ruh, wa nafaktu fihi min ruhi. 
in the Sharia is called Ruh, in philosophy is called Aql, in, in Arfan is called, you know, Ta'ayun al Awwal or Ayan al Thabit or something like that, right? So, there, so every discipline has its own way of expressing those same realities based on so many factors, time and temperament and the temperament of the individual. You know, the poet will express it as, you know, Mahabba, Habib. And Thank so you. on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I want to be respectful of your uh, uh, time as well, Dr. Mukhtar. But one, one quick point that um, I wanted to sort of uh, perhaps bring up or maybe end with is this idea of Mahabba that you just mentioned, you know. Um, I, I listened to a tafsir of uh, Surah Tasharh, uh, which the last two verses of that surah, which, you know, I think we've talked about it in our group here, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Faida farakhta fansab wa ila rabbika farrab. You know, and in that, in those two beautiful verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sort of tips his hat in, in recognizing that we have things to do. We have a mission to accomplish. We have work to do in this dunya. Um, but he's lovingly asking us, when you're done with all of that, you know, turn your attention to me, you know, or, you know, look at me. And this is, this is a language of love where, mm. you know, the, the beloved says, you know, when you're done with all your work, you know, or your, when your parent says, you know, son, when you're done with all your work, please give me a call. Mm. Um, it's that kind of language. And so that mahabba is built into, into that system. And obviously, is the, is the goal, you know, um, Aqima salat li dhikri. So the, the li points to the fact that dhikr is the ultimate goal and the salah is a tool to that end or means to that end. So inshallah, you know, this sitting was uh, incredibly beneficial. I don't know if there were any last minute questions that uh, um, people had, um, but uh, otherwise I'd love to uh, thank everybody for participating and uh, setting aside two hours of your morning time on a weekend or evening, depending on where people are calling from. And more, more than anything else to Dr. Mukhtar Ali here, uh, I know that these topics are very inaccessible to many of us, even though there's incredible interest um, in learning about these topics. And uh, so I really, really want to thank you, Dr. Mukhtar Ali, for giving us your time and your sharing your wisdom and your experiences, being patient with us, patient with our questions, <laughs> being so graceful in your adab and your manners uh, and it, it clearly shows. So we would love to have you again, but uh, we'd love to give you a break as well. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, obviously. Before yeah, we alhamdulillah. No, thank you very much for, for organizing. I thank everybody for, for coming and again, spending time. You know, these jalasat, what we want, we want to be, we want to learn something. We want to be inspired. We want to ask questions. And sometimes we don't have answers, you know, we don't have all, you know, this, but so, so, so a forum like this is really, uh, it's, it's, it's a way not only that we also can connect as a community. I mean, there are people from all over the world, I think, who are connecting and you would never do this in, in another time. We would have to, you know, it's something impossible now because of Zoom, we're able to share uh, these ideas and alhamdulillah, I think it's, uh, these, are, these are really great questions and, and discussion points. Um, and I love, and I, again, you know, I'd love to hear more from, from people so we can continue the discussion. And I, I'd love to you know, carry on um, on a regular basis. So I, I, this is very enlightening for me and very fruitful. Yeah. MashaAllah. So, we, yeah. There's no dearth of questions. So if you are <laughs> signing up for that, there will be yeah. a, a lot more questions. But alhamdulillah, yeah. we uh, benefited from both these sittings. I will, uh, as I did last time, upload this video as well um, on YouTube. And so that people who couldn't attend in person uh, or over Zoom are able to benefit as well. Um, Great. I mean, I look forward to doing it on a regular basis. So, you know, please... Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you again for facilitating this. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Jazakallah. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you all next time, inshallah. Alaikum assalam. Be safe. Inshallah, inshallah.